Ladies and gentlemen, this week I am delighted to, uh, to introduce General David H. Petraeus. Uh, he's a celebrated U.S. four-star general who served 37 years and led the U.S. forces in both Iraq and Afghanistan. A previous guest who you will have heard on the podcast, Brigadier James Richardson, uh, co-chaired David's Brains Trust, it was called, in Baghdad with the brightest and the best people alongside General H.R. McMaster, who became National Security Advisor in the U.S., and James said the following, uh, David is an Anglophile and a true warrior academic. He is the most impressive leader I have ever worked for, giving time, constructive criticism, guidance, and mental agility to see the consequences and the risks of change. He was incredibly brave as a leader, taking US forces out of large force protected camps to dominate the towns and the cities. This was a complete change to previous failing risk aversion. So David was former uh, CIA director from 2011 to 2012. He's now a partner at the New York investment firm KKR, and they've made him the chairman of the KKR Global Institute. He's a sportsman, an academic, an inspiring leader with prolific publications and insightful media commentary, which I continue to watch every day. David, thanks uh, uh, to have the honor of you being a guest on here. I very much enjoyed your appearances in the media and also on the Money Base podcast with a previous guest we had on here, Simon Brewer. Welcome. Great to be with you, Jonathan. Thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, it's great. And we were talking earlier about uh, inspiring leaders uh, that you've known and, and that you see in business. Uh, and for you, what does inspiring leadership mean? And, and would you perhaps call out a couple of people, business CEOs that you find inspiring? Sure. I, I think inspired leadership has a number of different qualities. Um, at the very strategic level, at the very top, you have to get the big ideas right, get the strategy right, communicate it, oversee the implementation, determine how to refine it and do it again and again and again. And in the business world, I think the names that come to mind, some of whom I've known personally, some others a bit from afar, uh, but certainly Jeff Bezos of Amazon would, would be one of these. And I do know him and he also conveys incredible energy, uh, it, it is inspirational, uh, can guide, can encourage, can drive, can do all these tasks. But above all, it, it's the strategic judgment that he's demonstrated almost unerring over time. The ability to communicate that throughout the breadth and depth of the organization and then out and around and to clients and investors and so forth to drive the campaign plan, to oversee its implementation, and then to determine how to refine it, to pick up new big ideas, do it again and again. Reed Hastings from Netflix, I know as well. I've actually discussed this intellectual construct for strategic leadership. For what it's worth, we uh, captured this, distilled it at a website at the uh, Harvard's Belfer Center, if folks ever want to look at that. Uh, Reed Hastings has done that brilliantly with Netflix, several different iterations. He just actually has announced uh, his intent to retire, but but took Netflix from a company that has basically just put movies in the hands of customers without brick and mortar into the greatest streaming service and then production uh, of its own content and even garnered the most Academy Award nominations a couple of years ago. So again, truly extraordinary. Jack Ma, the same, similar in some respects, uh, if you will, both in the business and uh, his leadership uh, to Jeff Bezos. And then many with whom I was privileged to serve over the years uh, in the military, at the CIA. Um, what I think of uh, great inspirational British leaders, uh, someone we know affectionately and admiringly as Jacko, uh, General Sir Mike Jackson, um, who I saw at a variety of different junctures, uh, including uh, early on uh, when he was the individual who said, you know, we shouldn't start World War III over Pristina Airfield. For what it's worth, I was the, the uh, chief of staff, if you will, executive officer for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs who had to convey to the then Sakir uh, mm -hmm. that uh, do not order Jacko to take Pristina. Uh, this was uh, General Sir Charles Guthrie uh, was on the line with my boss, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and our vice chairman was with the National Security Advisor, all everyone shouting back and forth through the office doors. But Jacko, again, just captures all of this, uh, and again, a truly inspirational figure. Um, then a number of others in my own uh, military, General Galvin, for whom I served uh, three different times personally, uh, as an aide, as a special assistant, as a speechwriter, when he was the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, he, he was someone I really wanted to emulate, try to be like. He was a soldier, scholar, statesman. He had written books. He was, he didn't, again, did a fair amount in the press, but not the kind of chest beating stuff 
He had these qualities of a brilliant strategic leader. Uh, and again, someone hugely influential, the biggest mentor really that I had. <clears throat> My own father-in-law, actually a soldier, scholar, statesman as well, ultimately was a, a four-star general in the U.S. representative of the NATO military committee. Um, general Jack Keane, <clears throat> still quite visible uh, as a uh, media presence on Fox News in particular, but again, a very close mentor of mine at critical junctures. And the guy literally standing next to me when he was a one-star, I was a lieutenant colonel and got shot in an aggressive live fire exercise one time when I was commanding a battalion of the great 101st Airborne Division. But it's beyond that. You know, when I was that battalion commander, there was an incredible company commander, Captain Fred Johnson, ultimately retired as a colonel, multiple tours uh, in, in Iraq together. Uh, an extraordinary soldier. Sparks jumped off him. I mean, you just wanted to be in his orbit. He he did more to develop me as a battalion commander, arguably, than did those who were above me, who theoretically should have been in, in that business, although certainly Jack Keane uh, and my brigade commander, uh, Bob Clark, did a great deal as well. But he he was a real student of soldiering and got into it and, again, just drove but everybody wanted to be with him. Everyone wanted to be like him. Uh, everyone wanted to be around him. And, and again, his unit was just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a goal, for example, that if you could get 20 enlisted and non-commissioned officer rangers in a single infantry company, it started to run itself. Mm -hmm. And that was the genesis of one of the emphases that we had. And his company was the first to achieve that. The first and the only one for a while in the entire 101st Airborne Division. We eventually got one or two others in our battalion. But again, it's that kind of leadership, real passion, real drive. And by the way, you've got to lead from the front. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to be able to provide not just energy uh, in inspiring words, but an in inspiring example. And he was also, we in fact were big physical fitness buffs, raced numerous times, um, and fiercely competitive in that regard as yeah. well. Uh, yeah. So these are the qualities, I think, that really, again, provide that. And one last individual that I want to highlight, Command Sergeant Major Marvin Hill. Uh, he was the Command Sergeant Major when I took command of the 101st Airborne Division. We ultimately had four combat commands together, the division uh, the surge in Iraq when we commanded the multinational force, all U.S. and coalition forces, U.S. Central Command, he went with me there. And then he went on very short notice with me to command uh, the International Security Assistance Force and U.S. forces in Afghanistan as well. And actually declined the position of being the first ever senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs because he felt he could do more for the U.S. force in Afghanistan than he could sitting in an office in the Pentagon. An extraordinary individual again, uh, and someone who above all, for those that listen to this and and are either non-commissioned or commissioned officers, he was not a backseat of the commander's Humvee or helicopter sergeant major. He went off on his own. We recognize that his biggest contribution would be to expand my impact. Uh, and you don't do that by just hanging out with the boss. We did certainly, obviously, did particularly representational ceremonial uh, events together, especially memorial services in Iraq and Afghanistan. But most of the time, he was off on his own. And he did it, by the way, on the ground, convoyed uh, around Iraq in particular, uh, got hit. That, that, that convoy of his was hit over a dozen times by improvised explosive devices. Uh, that's, again inspiring leadership brilliant well no you, you've triggered so many thoughts and uh you and i were speaking both about jacko who i think did surprise the russians at pristina because they never expected him to speak intel uh intelligent uh, russian which of course he did as a former intelligence officer who transferred and then general guthrie i saw a lot when i worked for field marshal the lord inge the late field marshal lord inge as his adc and and guthrie was charming but yet uh incisive in what he did charming and then, charming charming sas and yeah exactly and then leading from the front is the name of uh general the lord down its book which i was just looking at on my shelf there and richard was uh, in no, richard well yes and, and yep, we served together go back we a long temporaries way. yeah and 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 he also like you he 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 picked his his sergeant who became his sergeant major and as they moved along together he had him as his senior soldier and, and i think that that combination between uh an officer 
and their senior enlisted uh, man is very important if you get a really good one. And many of the leaders have been there. And I think in business, it's it's very important for people to find that sort of number two or that someone else who can very cover nice things so. while, while you're doing it. And I think people who do that uh, do very well. Let's talk a bit about spent about five minutes or so talking about your life journey and, and how it shaped you. And maybe if you pick out some experience of some individuals who shaped the, the leader you are today. And by the way, for someone who's 70, you look about sort of in your sort of late 50s. I don't know how you manage it. You're still keeping fit. Are you training hard? Yeah, I try to. Yeah, I work at it. Yeah, well, that's that's great. So so tell us a bit about your life journey. I mean, you had a father who was Dutch and a mother who was from Brooklyn and came together. I mean, that was quite shaping. Yeah, my father was a Dutch uh, sea captain, uh, actually a merchant marine officer. Uh, they were at sea uh, on a Netherlands ship uh, when the Nazis overran Holland. They couldn't go back to Rotterdam. They came up to New York Harbor. They turned and went right into Brooklyn Navy Yard and say, are you hiring? Uh, so this was very early on, well before we had entered the war. Uh, the U.S. was desperate for additional merchant mariners. Um, and ultimately, very quickly, he became the captain of a Liberty ship. You know, we could we could produce the ships. We couldn't produce the crews. And of course, the ships were being sunk at an alarming rate early on in the war. Uh, he did a Murmansk run. But again, the idea of a crusty Dutch, somewhat blunt, um, very thrifty, hardworking, uh, again, former Dutch uh, merchant marine officer, that is a big shaping influence in your life. Mm. Um, you know, you didn't come home from school and say, well, you know, I, he wasn't buying excuses. I mean, he, his response would basically be to listen for a moment and then say results boy. And that was it. Um, wow. And that is a fairly, you know, fairly blunt response uh, and Dutch are known for that kind of uh, response. So <laughs> that was important. And the idea again, of just sheer hard work, um, he eventually uh, retired from the sea because we were trying to settle down up in the Hudson River north of New York uh, and became an operating room engineer in a, a electrical generating station, something that all merchant mariners know how to do is generate power, of course. Um, and we, we were I was born and raised in a lovely town uh, about 50 miles north of New York. Great schools, great uh, athletic programs, great community programs, great churches, everything really that you would want as a kid, uh, and then ended up going all of seven miles to the U.S. Military Academy around Storm King Mountain, uh, because I've been impressed by those who were serving at West Point, who were products of West Point, um, and had come from West Point. We had teachers in our school who had been professors, the coach of our soccer team, which won the championship our senior year, and actually coached a championship team at West Point. He was a retired colonel doing it for a dollar a year for us. Um, I think a lot of life is you want to be like someone you admire. And half the people in my newspaper route were connected to West Point in some way or other. Uh, I admired them. And so I sought to be like them. West Point, obviously a very formative experience. That's where I really learned, you know, number one, I can compete with the best that are out there, uh, but you do have to compete. Uh, and the gentleman's bee is not what you want, um, which, by the way, to a degree in a peacetime army, there's a little bit of a culture of being too cool for school, um, trying to push the envelope in whatever it might be. Uh, and, uh, you know, sort of early on, I recognized that actually you don't get a T-shirt just for showing up in the real world. You, mm. you, you don't get, you know, a trophy as in little kids soccer. Uh, for participation, you get it for excellence, but you want to compete not just to be the best individually, but the best as a team player as well. And, you know, when I then was commissioned and going to the basic course in Ranger School and so forth, you know, I, look, I went to Ranger School trying to, again, if there was an award, I was going to try to win it, uh, to earn it. Uh, but again, being the best team player you could be, the best Ranger buddy uh, at the same time. And that actually all transpired and and you recognize that, you know, maybe you have an ability for this stuff. And then I found, frankly, as I progressed in the military, I'm sure like you, I enjoyed the mix of intellectual demands, physical demands, uh, again, often in airborne or air assault infantry units, uh, and then leadership responsibilities. And I think it's really the only place where you have all of that. 
um, you know, you're literally under a rucksack. You're jumping out of a plane in the middle of the night with a very heavy load. You're going to walk to daylight. You have to be able again to lead from the front, but you also have to think and you have to uh, get the big ideas right, the right emphases, you, all of this. And of course, you've got to inspire, you've got to provide example, you've got to communicate effectively, uh, and you're always refining what it is you're doing so you can do it again and again and again. And again, I, I just found these incredible opportunities. The Army even sent me to graduate school, uh, was fortunate to, to complete a PhD at Princeton University in a combination of international relations and economics, and then sort of started going between jobs that were unbelievable vantage points, aide to the chief of staff of the army, exec to the chairman of the joint chief, speech writer for the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, because I think of some of the intellectual uh, capabilities, perhaps, uh, but then, you know, back to the infantry under a rucksack and you have that thrill and excitement and, and enjoyment and doing it as a leader as well. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you get into the war years and, you know, just I don't think there's anyone more privileged than I was, you know, to have six consecutive commands as a general officer, five of which were in combat, including the surge in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Uh, you know, again, I was just blessed beyond uh, any possible uh, hope that I might have had early on in life. Yeah, well, you remind me, I had a couple of other guests Um you, they were probably after your time, but James Bashel was a parachute regiment officer who served in uh, Basra, uh, was one of the generals there. And also Jonathan Shaw was special forces, sure. again, yep. airborne forces. But um, I wondered if you ever came served beside uh, William McRaven, who I always love his make your bed. Did you ever come together at any stage? Yeah, only about five years in combat. <laughs> only five years so let me that. explain i mean he was the deputy commander of the joint special operations command when i was two and three star uh in iraq uh, by the time i was a four star he was the commander of J joint special operations command he was full-time just about in in iraq during the surge in iraq then when i went to central command he was still now he was starting to shift between iraq and afghanistan then by the time i was the commander in afghanistan he was still the joint special operations and that's when of course uh, his forces brought Osama bin Laden to justice. And that was literally the last uh, major operation that he conducted and actually my final command before going to the CIA. Then he moved to Special Operations Command. And there was a very close relationship between SOCOM and the CIA. Mm. So and it continues to this day, by the way. We've done a number of events on stage together. He's a, He is a brilliantly inspirational uh, individual and yeah. i probably should have highlighted him earlier because let's, he also, let's get him on let's get him on the series i he do, also do is, love his spectacular yep. yeah I, I do love his his talk i mean like you he's got some marvelous stories to tell but also there's that lovely humility which is so important and which takes me on to the next question really which was um you know your happiest proudest moment in your life uh, may not be work maybe personal life and, and then your darkest moment and, and what you learned from those two imposters you know there were so many really sort of wonderful moments if, if you will you know both you know in, in your family the obvious ones of kids and their achievements and and so forth um and you know marriage approaching 50 years etc cetera, etc cetera. um and then professionally, you know, it. there's along the way, again, there's just every level, there was something that you look back and say, God, that was really, really, really wonderful stuff. But at the end of the day, I think you have to say, OK, what was most important, most meaningful, most consequential? And that's the surge in Iraq. Yeah. Um, you know, of a 19 and a half month command to drive violence down by over 85 percent to give Iraq an entire new opportunity, which they did very well with over the next three and a half years, then undid it, then got it back together with our help again. And, and now, actually, I think very much touch wood, but cautiously optimistic about the trajectory of Iraq, having taken a year to form a government, but a prime minister um, who has been able to balance all these competing forces, including those, of course, from the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps Quds Force and the Shia militia they support. But he just publicly said he wants U.S. forces to remain, uh, to continue to help the Iraqi security forces ensure that uh, the elements of the Islamic State that are still present as insurgents and terrorists cannot reconstitute as the kind of army, really, that they mm -hmm. had when they established the caliphate in northern Iraq and northeastern Syria. Uh, so, again, I think you have to come back to the surge in Iraq, certainly Afghanistan. There's a number of other 
uh, endeavors over the years, of which I'm, you know, really quietly proud. Uh, and then look, life is not without, you know, setbacks and and, and mistakes and uh, individuals in, that you're privileged to lead make mistakes. You make mistakes. Uh, life is not full of high five moments. Um, it's yeah. not all spike in the football in the end zone. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways, the measure of an individual is how you respond, not to success, obviously, but to adversity. In fact, yeah. another one of my inspirational Brit friends who I should have mentioned earlier, General Sir Graham Lamb. Oh, yes, uh, Lamb. Who yeah. I was privileged to serve with all the way back when he was the director of special forces. And I was a one star in Bosnia doing the war criminal hunt. Um, and he would come out for the joint operations that the U.S. and U.K. would run. We got more war criminals in that one year than I think we'd gotten in all the years prior to that time. Then we were division commanders together during the fight to Baghdad, albeit uh, they went down to Basra. Um, then we were three star counterparts in our respective tours back in our home countries. He was the deputy commander uh, in of the multinational force Iraq. I literally stopped in London to see Prime Minister Blair and ask him to leave. Uh, Sir Graham uh, there at the time because I needed him. He was going to help me com convince our force that would be understandably skeptical that we needed to reconcile with some of the uh, rank and file, if you will, of the insurgents and the Shia militia. You can't kill or capture your way out of an industrial strength insurgency. You have to reconcile with as many as you can and then redouble, intensify uh, the relentless pursuit of the irreconcilables, those at the top. And for that, of course, it was General McRaven, first General McChrystal, then General McRaven uh, with uh, SEAL Team 6, Delta Force, uh, Rangers, and 22 SAS, which is a big part of that, is all publicly known, of course. Mm. Um, and then, it, it, you know, it continued on after that, even. Again, we're still very good, close personal friends. Mm. Um so he wrote to me, I remember, um, after I left government, he said, uh, there's an old adage, don't tell me how high the guy jumped, tell, how, tell me how high he jumped back after he got knocked down. Mm -hmm. And I think that is actually the measure of an individual. And um, so again, it's life's about, you know, once you, when you're down on the canvas, uh, you got to get back up, you got to dust yourself off, you got to get the rucksack back on again, and you got to start putting one foot in front of the other and repeating the process. Yeah, and, and you, you are so right on that one. And um, we've come across tragically too many political leaders, both in your country and in the United Kingdom, which you know very well, who never admit they have mistakes. Um, they just blindly carry on. Whereas you, you have when you've, you know, when things have not worked out, you've admitted it. And I think I think the courage of, particularly it's in the military, they go, I made a mistake and I'll resign or whatever's required. Um, whereas in politics, they just carry on. Well, yeah, look, you have to start by acknowledging that something didn't go well, mm. uh, that there was a mistake either you or someone in the organization made. Um, you have to, again, publicly uh, acknowledge that mm. and then talk about what you can learn from that, how you can change so you reduce the risk of something like that happening in the future. Yeah, um, so true. We so had, true. We had... I mean, tons of those moments in the battlefield, whether it was the sergeant who decided that he should use pages of the Quran for uh, zero in his uh, M4 carbine and a uh, host nation worker found it. And, you know, pretty quickly, I was apologizing to the prime minister on camera uh, in the Iraqi White House and President Bush calling him. Again, there, these moments happen. And again, you make mistakes yourself. And the only recourse, I think, is to, uh, again, recognize, acknowledge, learn and then move on yeah yeah and and thinking back to all the experience that you've had in your 70 years if you could go back to the young david petraeus and see yourself age 16 to 18 i mean you've had a son and uh stephen uh, you got a daughter as well Anne. but uh stephen you were very privileged to see him serve in afghanistan i see a picture of the two of you together but if you go back to your your own youth what, what advice, knowing all the things you've done now, all the mistakes you've made, all the successes you've had and the accolades, what bit of advice, this, this matters, don't worry about that. What would you give advice to yourself? Probably two elements, I think. Um, one would be, again, that life is a competitive endeavor. Uh, you have to embrace that uh, and you need to compete. Uh, but as you compete to be the best that you can be, 
recognize that you need to compete to be the best team team player that you can be as well. And that's crucially important. And then the other adage, I guess, would be that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And, you know, the opportunity may or may not actually present itself. Uh, it did in my case, and I was incredibly fortunate in that regard. Timing and luck, that is actually part of it. But the key is being ready. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to think that I had literally spent a lifetime preparing for the opportunities that came along uh, and that that helped me uh, do as well as I possibly could at the least, mm. uh, again, to, you know, command a division, command the multinational security transition, command Iraq. Actually, the command in the United States between the three and four star tours in Iraq was hugely important because that's where we crafted the counterinsurgency field manual. We overhauled every aspect of preparation of soldiers, leaders, staffs, units, material, organizational structures, everything uh, for the road to deployment, uh, mm. and including the final exercise, the mission rehearsal exercise conducted in the Mojave Desert at the National Training Center. I mean, this was hugely significant. Yeah. Uh, and again, now you have the intellectual foundation in the counterinsurgency field, man. You have the big ideas. Um, and of course, you've got to, to train on them. You've got to educate leaders on them. Uh, and I was privileged to oversee all of the uh, commission, non-commission, warrant officer, uh, professional development courses throughout our army, uh, as well as that training scenario, as well as the staff mm -hmm. call, as well as all the rest of this stuff. So again, but you've got to, you have to have thought your way through. And then, you, because we produced that manual in less than a year. Yes, I classmated my old West Point classmate who had gotten out, was a PhD professor at, at, at the Army War College and noted uh, expert on irregular warfare. Um, but again, you have to drive that process. No manual's ever been produced in less than a year before. And I did it, of course, with my comrade, Jim Mattis, another inspirational. Yeah, uh, Jim, Jim Mattis. I signaled out earlier. He and I were in counterpart positions in the Army and Marine Corps. Yeah, uh, I, I enjoyed, so I very much enjoyed his his book, um, Mad Dog Mattis' book. Um, but I, I think what you're describing there, and people kindly described you as a world-leading expert in counter insurgency is that you brought together as you did with your brain trust the best and the brightest you knew how to it's always the key yeah it's always the key, the key. It's, you, you don't you know, as, no one of us is smarter than all of us together exactly and uh, was, i've known some people that actually maybe believe it or not actually were i mean there's one individual that comes to mind will be on name that I think a very, very high position would go in and meet with his staff and he'd actually look, you know, the J3 or whatever. The, yeah, he actually could do that guy's job better. Um, he could do the J, he could do each one of their jobs individually. Probably he would just sheer off the charts brilliant. But what he didn't recognize is that he couldn't do all of their jobs and his job better right. simultaneously. And even if that was possible, which is not inconceivable, um, that the effect on the unit would be so damaging. Correct. Uh, Correct. So, but no, you've always got to build the best team that you possibly can. And we spent a great deal of time tracking, you know, where are the Rhodes Scholars? Where are the Marshall Scholars? Where, and mm -hmm. you know, my view was that they were either working for me or they'd already worked for me or they were going to work for me. I mean, those were the only- Yeah, well, it was very, very interesting because you and I were talking earlier before we came on air about uh, General Rupert Smith. Uh, and Lord Inge. Now, when I was working for Lord Inge as his ADC, and you were doing your job uh, for, for more senior, but he used to go back and see General Bagnall. Now, Bagnall started yeah. the Ginger Group, as you probably remember, which yep. was a similar thing to the, what you did. He got the brightest of the breast, like Richard Dannett yep. and other people, Rupert Smith, and, and they changed the way things were being done in the, the sort of uh, solid, you know, border defense to more maneuver warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you've done the same with counterinsurgency. And you looked back at Vietnam as one of your papers that you studied. I was reading about and you went, you know, we we the result we learned from that is not to get involved, which wasn't the right answer. No. But I think we've now got a similar situation for the British Army where we got quite a bloody nose in Iraq and Afghanistan with our particular tactic. And we've sort of lost confidence a bit. And I think we need to go through a, a similar Relooking at how we do things because war is very different now. I don't know what you think. Well, you know, I actually sought, I volunteered to uh, testify, I guess is the term, for the Chilcote Commission, 
Uh, and then also for uh, parliamentary commissions on Afghanistan by both your, your equivalent of the uh, Armed Services Committee and the Foreign uh, Affairs Committee. Um, and I, I think what sort of got off the rails a bit was more the political, you know, the 2,500 mile screwdriver that was forcing uh, certain activities in Basra uh, to a lesser degree in Afghanistan, although some there as well, um, to do what the leaders, I think, knew they shouldn't be doing. I mean, for example, withdrawing <clears throat> from all of the combat outposts and bases in Basra and withdrawing the advisors uh, from the Iraqi army units that were in Basra. And thankfully, during the Battle of Basra, a very courageous uh, brigadier, his boss was on leave skiing, but a courageous brigadier sent the uh, the MIT teams, again, uh, the advisor teams, back into Basra with the units, linked up with them. And that was a critical element in the ultimate defeat of uh, the Shia militia supported by Iran because without having the advisors with them, we couldn't identify where the actual Iraqi units were and mm. the Iraqi soldiers. Um, having had the Iraqi prime minister also send elements of two other divisions down without advisors, which we then linked up very quickly. But initially from a predator in the soda straw view of a drone, uh, there's just a lot of guys down there fighting and you could, it was a fur ball, if you will. Mm. And it was difficult to identify where are the front lines, if there are any, or at least where are the friendlies and where are the enemies to bring to bear all of the capacity that we shifted down to support this very impulsive and very sudden decision by the prime minister that had not been coordinated with us prior to him calling me in literally on the day or day before that they actually launched these forces down there. Mm. So again, I, I tend to think that it was really restrictions put on the forces that they knew they shouldn't do, but had to. And at mm. the end of the day, this is how our systems work. Mm. Um, but that's what has to be recognized. And then the question is, how should you respond to that? Was there sufficiently forthright uh, pushback? Was there all the rest of that. Um, and that's, I think, what is the right topic to discuss. And, you know, should there actually, at some point in time, should people say, then, okay, I'll let you do this without me? Yeah, well, I mean, you've, you know, as you've said yourself, you've got the humility to admit you're not always right. But I think when I've listened to your commentary on whether it be tanks going in to uh, Ukraine at the moment, or when you were warning them when they were going to pull out of uh, Afghanistan and Kabul that you needed to make use of drones and various things to allow the people to come in in an orderly way rather than the chaos that you predicted would happen. I think, you know, your commentary, people are genuinely very interested in what you have to say, because I think you tend to predict the way things are going. Uh, we will come back on to your story in a minute, but just in a short um, view from you, as you look at Ukraine, how do you think that war there is going to end? I mean, that's a big million dollar think, question. Yeah, John, I think it ends in a negotiated resolution. Let me sketch out how that sort of happens. Um, what we need to do is to provide everything possible uh, that the Ukrainians need and can employ effectively as quickly as we can so that they can hasten the moment when Vladimir Putin realizes that this war is not sustainable not sustainable on the battlefield and not sustainable on the home front in the Russian Federation. The Russians have already taken at least eight times the losses in soldiers in 11 months in Ukraine that they took in nearly 10 years in Afghanistan. Uh, that is approaching unsustainable, although frankly, Putin appears doubling down at this point in time. He's going to expand the size of the Russian military by 150 or 200,000. He's trying to revive the military industries and so forth. There will be another round of conscription of some type mobilization. Um, but at the end of the day, the Ukrainians have to make this unsustainable on the battlefield. And the U.S.-led Western coalition has to tighten further the financial, economic, and personal sanctions and export controls uh, on Russia so that there's a realization that on the home front, uh, again, it's not sustainable either. 
recognizing that Russia is sent from central casting the best country in the world to withstand sanctions because they're a top three producer of natural gas, oil, and coal, which the rest of the world desperately needs. And some countries will actually buy, albeit at a discount, despite the various sanctions and export controls. Mm -hmm. So we've got it. That's what we need to do. And when that moment arrives, then I think Putin will recognize that there have to be meaningful negotiations. And Ukraine, which has to stop at some point the missile and drone swarm attacks and so forth, such as we saw again last night in a wake of the uh, dis- the announcement of the decision to provide American and German tanks, um, they also will need a marshal like plan to help rebuild the country. And to ensure that that succeeds, they will need an ironclad security guarantee, whether that is NATO membership, which I'd prefer, but may be Im- unattainable given perhaps Hungary, Turkey, or other countries that might object. You have to have unanimity uh, in NATO membership. Uh, as we're seeing with the delay in Finland and Sweden right now. But if you can't get that, then there will have to be a U.S.-led coalition of the willing that the U.K. would very likely be part of to have an ironclad security guarantee. Because without that, you're not going to have successful reconstruction and certainly not going to have outside investment. But Mm. those are, I think, the elements that will have to come together to achieve this negotiated resolution. I'd like to think that Ukraine could have liberated as much as is absolutely possible of what Russia is currently occupying. Uh, But that will depend, again, very significantly on what we provide and whether the Ukrainians can continue to out-mobilize to do far better than Russia at at recruiting, training, equipping, and employing additional forces and capabilities. Mm. the The whole area is so fascinating, and I do encourage people to continue to listen to your commentary and your your views that you have on on various different media channels it's really interesting um but i will come back take you from strategic back to the personal um as you, as you look over your life um if you could change one thing in your life or if there was a crucible moment in your life that really has shaped you which of those two do you want to talk about look i i think all of us actually have many crucible moments um some of those include you know, events we'd like to have a do over or again, try to have precluded or prevented or what have you again, some, some you can control, some are out of your control. Um, Some of the achievements along the way, I don't think there's any single uh, event, there are important events along the way. Um, Again, particular achievements that that really help to form you. But at the end of the day, it's the cumulative uh, effect of all of these uh, experiences, all of your efforts over the years. Um, Again, sometimes it's good fortune, it's timing. uh, It's just the luck of having an incredible boss or an incredible command sergeant major, as I said, an incredible company commander when you're a battalion commander. all of this, I think, comes together and, and shapes you into the individual that you are uh, when that moment comes where you really have to step up. Um, you know, Napoleon had that old saying, I think something along the lines of every private has a field marshal's baton in his mm-hmm. rucksack. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that moment comes, OK, uh, you know, Bowman for field marshal, Petraeus for field marshal, you got to be ready. And metaphorically speaking, that field marshal's baton is all the effort that you've made over the years to be ready for that moment, to have prepared so that because luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Mm -hmm. Just a quick side note, one of the times that I was with the parachute regiment, uh, we made a handful of jumps in the morning from a balloon, big thrill straight down. You know, there's no sideways motion as when you go out of a Hercules. Um, And so in the afternoon, there was a second uh, lieutenant who was my escort or whatever, uh, airborne buddy for our time with the the regiment he said well you want to go to the pub this afternoon we have a couple hours free he said sure but could we stop at that sort of military sales store that's outside that i understand one of your former regimental sergeant majors runs he said sure it's on the way so we stopped in there and i asked him i said hey you have any used field marshal batons you know, sort of, <laughs> i want to put one in my rucksack so that every time i reach in i'm reminded you got to be ready 
And he said, oh, fresh out, mate. But, you know, I do a little <laughs> swagger stick. It was a miniature swagger stick. And I said, I'll take it. And I tied it to my rucksack, you know, with that green nylon cord. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Burned at the ends with proper knots. And it completely covered it. So you didn't actually know that underneath it was anything other than just a whole bunch of 550 cord. Um, but I knew every time I picked that rucksack up and I kept it with me for, for decades, actually, before I finally had to turn it in where there was just no plausible reason for a central command commander to have a rucksack, I guess, or something. But yeah. every time I picked that rucksack up, it reminded me, you got to do your best. You've got to be prepared. You've got to take every opportunity. Um, and I, I did, you know, and I often did out of the ordinary stuff, you know, the path less traveled, uh, mm -hmm. the in, out of your intellectual comfort zone, you know, going to graduate school was an incredible experience, civilian graduate school. And you realize mm -hmm. there are seriously bright people in the world who don't see it through the same prism that we do. I went to the armor officer advanced course rather than infantry. I did infantry by correspondence. Mm -hmm. so I, mm -hmm. I just wanted, you know, what are tanks all about? I've been an airborne infantryman to that point. I did a fellowship at Georgetown instead of the war college. And then instead of finishing the fellowship, I deployed to Haiti to be the chief of operations for the United Nations force in Haiti, not even a U.S. hat, just a pure blue beret and an incredible experience standing up the United Nations force and mission, uh, working with coalition forces from all around the world, as would be the case uh, years later and learning about the challenges of, you know, mm. Churchill had it right. The only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. <laughs> uh, and uh, so these were all wonderful experiences along the way. And then, you know, you get the fortune to do Bosnia when and the war criminal hunt, as well as sort of the NATO peacekeeping and then actually counterterrorism uh, in Bosnia. The first counterterrorism operation after 9-11 was not in Afghanistan. It was actually in Sarajevo. Yeah. Uh, and I'm the deputy commander of that. So all of these, these are all formative events. Um, oh, and, and again, all of those inspirational leaders that you, you, that I, some of whom I listed, others I recalled later on and, and even more that we could, we could write down. Again, that's all part of it. And what you're trying to do is put yourself into positions in which you can learn, observe, and do and that's really the key in life, I think. And and never ever stop your own self study. In well, fact, uh, I, just, I add, I'm, I'm just finishing a book. We just sent the the uh, first draft, if you will, to the publisher uh, of a book with your Andrew Roberts, now Lord Roberts mm -hmm. of Belgravia, mm -hmm. uh, your noted biographer and historian. It's titled "Conflict: The Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to." Ukraine. And it's been great fun to do that and very instructive once again. And it forces you to keep your intellectual capital current. Well, you, cer you certainly do. And I think KKR are very lucky to have you. And I think it would be remiss of me not to ask you just a bit, explain a bit about KKR to those who don't know the investment. Sure. Firm, you. Yeah. So KKR and, is a, and your part in, in the yeah. organization. Sure. KKR is a global investment firm. Um, we manage about $500 billion. We own over 120 companies uh, fully, and then we have minority investments and in way over 100 more. This is all around the world. Uh, offices, I think it's 21 or 23 offices uh, around the world. In fact, our regional office for Europe is there in London. Um, and I'm a partner in the firm and also with all the typical partner duties, but also the chair of the KKR Global Institute, which I established about 10 years ago, which exists to identify uh, potential geopolitical risks and then to integrate the macroeconomic uh, elements and potential risks, the environmental social governance issues uh, that could uh, affect whether an in investment should be done uh, mm -hmm. or more importantly, could affect its potential success and then identify ways to reduce these risks so that we have the confidence uh, to make investments. Mm. Once we've made investments, we help the companies uh, that we own as they run into problems. And it's uh, surprising how much actually you can help them uh, with just sheer determination, boots on the ground, uh, presence and so forth, and working with host nation leaders uh, when there are these issues that have to be resolved. And then we do a lot of work as well with our investors, uh, mm -hmm. those whose money we are managing, if you will, uh, who are all trying to understand the world 
in which we are investing together. It's a wonderfully intellectually stimulating uh, position. I travel in a normal year pre-COVID. I used to do about 25 countries a year. Boots on the ground still matter. Relationships are best done uh, in person. Uh, and that would include some of those countries, many more than one time, UK typically six to eight times in a single year. We're gradually getting back to that now uh, in the wake of COVID. Um, and again, I just can't say enough about how fortunate I am to actually be doing something that is so enjoyable, so stimulating, so rewarding, mm. uh, and frankly, fun. Yeah, and, and that's the key, I think, in our later years. I'm only 10 sure. years younger than you, but I think keeping things stimulating and, for me, meeting interesting people as a broadcaster, but also coaching CEOs around the world, stimulates mm -hmm. me. Takes me on to the, the, the last three questions, which is about executive teams, uh, a book you'd recommend, and then we'll go for your top tip. Um, executive teams, you've worked with so many leadership teams in so many different fields, and now you're working with all these different executive teams that you're investing in or part of KKR. Uh, what what if if you were to give a top tip about turning around a toxic team into a high performing team, what would be your advice? Well, it depends obviously on the, the, the particular circumstances of why there is the toxicity. Um, you know, it could be you have to change a leader uh, and we occasionally do that in the companies that, that we, we purchase um, or change key members of the team. That's often again, uh, why there is this, toxic relationship that may exist either overall. I mean, if you have a toxic climate, that's typically a result of a toxic uh, leader at the top. Uh, so again, I think you have to, uh, to get into it. You have to understand it. You have to uh, really uh, dig into the dynamics that are present, um, figure out why they are present. And then based on that, uh, take what, is the appropriate measure, whether again, it's replacing individuals or just sitting them down or, you know, the, uh, the common advice often is, uh, you know, for those who are in this kind of work is, have you considered talking to the individual? And the CEO says, <laughs> oh, really, you think I should do that? <laughs> well, yes, perhaps. And, you know, well, how would I go about that? Well, okay, let's, um, so, but again, it, it's always a particular case specifics dynamics that you've got to really understand very deeply you can't just do it superficially um and then having done that then determine what the appropriate response is yeah very good uh, so i mean you've read so many books you've written so many books you've written so many articles i mean in wikipedia it goes on for pages um if you were to recommend a book you've read recently that you think the audience would enjoy, which one is it? And what was it about it that you found so useful? Well, there are tons of these actually, um, but of all things, and I get people that come to me who are young commissioned or non-commissioned officers say, what, what should I read? And, and I often will go back to some old classics. Um, the reason why, for example, I think it was Cecil Woodham Smith, you know, about Crimea. It just it's about dynamics of leaders. Um, Wellington, the Years of the Sword uh, is another just phenomenal uh, book. Grant Takes Command, which I was actually reading Bruce Catton's classic uh, reading during the early months of the surge and found so incredibly inspirational. Like Grant is grappling with all the same issues I was dealing with. I don't want to equate Iraq to the American Civil War for sure, but but again, what he was doing as the leader of that, uh, and you know, and the casualties, the political pressures and interference, the uh, individuals underneath him, some not measuring up, all of these dynamics, uh, hugely important. But one that I keep coming back to, and again, only coincidentally, is does it involve uh, a Brit? Uh, is C.S. Forrester as the general? Mm -hmm. um, it's a slim book and what people don't immediately get out of it all the time is that this is a tragedy. This is an individual who is very admirable in many ways, great self-discipline, abstemious. He's not a Chateau general. He's up on the front lines. Uh, he, he's, he knows what the trenches are like. He's but at the end of the day, what some readers sometimes miss initially until you start talking about it is that 
for all of these, again, admirable, although a bit austere, certainly, uh, not a Jacko kind of uh, leader, but a more austere, but an admirable austere leader, at the end of the day, he fails in the most important task of a strategic leader, which is to get the big ideas right. And he says, well, okay, we we had, we had tried an attack. It was, an over, it was over a six kilometer front. We had a 30 minute prep with 10 battalions of artillery and we used two divisions and that didn't succeed. So clearly what we need to do is we need to attack over a three kilometer front with four divisions, a one hour prep, uh, you can see where this is going. And of course, the tragedy uh, of World War I was the inability of the leaders for quite a long period of time to recognize the dynamics on this battlefield and just sending soldiers uh, you know, into these horrific uh, mm -hmm. battles with just incomprehensible losses. Mm -hmm. um, really inconceivable, I think, in today's standards that you would have, you know, an entire class of Sancier or Sanders just ground into the mud yeah. uh, of the sum, Passchendaele. And, you know, and I, I remember with some young officers occasionally, you know, what does the word Passchendaele mean to you? And, oh, God, I don't know, sir, I never heard of it. Well, you need to learn about it because it's the essence of you've got to understand the dynamics on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was... Uh, Clausewitz, who said, you know, the first, the most important task of any leader is to understand the nature of the conflict and not try to make it into something you'd like it to be, uh, because what it is is an uncomfortable. This is very applicable, frankly, uh, for the U.S. and Vietnam. It, it took us all the way until probably 1968 to finally have a commander who recognized that, you know, local security is actually a heck of a lot more important. Uh, then the big war that we're fighting out there, which is very ephemeral in its, in its effects, uh, if you recognize that the enemy, you're not going to attrit this enemy. Mm. Uh, you're not going to escalate more than they are willing to escalate in return. Um, and so therefore, uh, again, sort of like the big idea in the surge, you mentioned this up front, mm. we have mm. to get off our big bases. We have to go back into the neighborhoods because security of the people is job one. And the Iraqi security forces can't provide it right now. So we have to go back in. Uh, we're going to live with the people to secure them. It's the only way you can do that. 77 additional locations just in the greater Baghdad area alone, most of which we had to fight to establish. Uh, and we're going to take back control from the Iraqi security forces. We're going to reconcile with as many of the, uh, the insurgent and Shia militia as we can while we intensify the relentless pursuit of the irreconcilables. It's going to be civil military, even more than all of these. So the tragedy of the general mm. is that he didn't get this. Uh, yeah. And that's why I think it's such an instructive, slim novel, to be sure, uh, yeah. but very, 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 very informative one. Well, well thank you for that, David, because uh, it resonates with me. My grandfather, George uh, fought in the Honorable Artillery Company, the 1st Battalion mm. E Company, and he was at that battle and uh, got smacked over the head with a marlin spike by the Germans and was left for two days in the uh, shell hole crawl back. But he was never the same. He suffered from PTSD yeah. and, and it, it, it had an impact on the whole of his generation. So in our last two minutes, um, I will just introduce you again and ask you for your top leadership tip which will be used in its own clip. So we're very lucky to have General David Petraeus, uh, four-star general, uh, 37 years in the US military, Iraq and Afghanistan as his two most famous uh, occasions, but also the director of the CIA and now a partner in KKR and the chairman of the KKR um, uh, Global Institute. So David, what's your top tip? Well, there are two. Uh, life is a competitive endeavor. Uh, you have to compete. You have to embrace that reality. You don't get a t-shirt just for showing up. Um, but as you're trying to be all that you can be to achieve all the individual excellence that is possible, you need to compete to be the best team player as well. And then second, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And you really do have to prepare. You have to be committed uh, to doing everything that you can uh, in every different facet of your personal and professional development to be ready for the opportunities. They may or may not come along, 
But if they do, you want to have done everything you possibly could so that when, you know, the president of the United States asks you on short notice to command the surge in Iraq, um, you're ready to do that. Yeah. David, fascinating having you on this program. We could easily have spoken for the rest of the day. Uh, but thank you. Great honor having you on it. And I'm sure you'll continue to give lots of wise advice, both in KKR and all the global media. So thank you. Privilege to be with you, Jonathan. Thank you.